Hallelujah. Oh my. I want to pray for everybody that is here today. And I just want to pray for you uh, from the very bottom of my heart that uh, you will find your way around in God's presence. The presence of God is the most precious thing that anyone can experience because it is in that presence of God that we have the fullness of joy. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is what? There is fullness of joy. I wonder where some people have gone to. I saw some people here, but I don't see them now. Are there people outside waiting for the service to start? I just encourage anyone that might be there to, to come uh, because, you know, the Bible says to provoke one another unto good works. This is not a moment that I would love for anyone to miss. It's a moment that I want us all to uh, be very much a part of and receive of. So the prayer, again, is that you will know your way around and be able to find your way around in the presence of God. Why? Because the Bible says without mincing words that in the presence of God is what? Fullness of joy. And so if the fullness of joy is in the presence of God, why wouldn't I do all of that which is within my power by obedience to do, to partake of that fullness of joy? You know, because again, as we were saying on Tuesday, we cannot enter what we are unable to see. When Nicodemus asked Jesus, he said to Jesus, um, so how can a man be saved? No, he, he came to Jesus by night and he was like, oh, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. And Jesus was like, yeah, whatever, you can say whatever, but what is really in your heart? And what did Jesus say? Jesus says, as it was recorded in John chapter 3, verse 3. If I let us begin with that verse of scripture or with that passage of scripture, rather let us go to the book of John chapter 3. Praise the Lord. John chapter 3, verse 3. Or maybe we read verse 1, just to buy some of those folks a bit more time to get in here. Uh, do we, is there a reason why there's a congregation in the back there? Are these guys coming in to sit down? Okay, all righty. If, if, if you want them to be a part of this, let them be seated. So that once we're, once we're started, we are started. Is that awesome? God is good. So John chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible says... Um, and I would, I'll explain my little attitude in just a minute, just in case you're wondering what this is about. Um, it's very unlike me, you know. I, I sometimes not, don't even notice certain things, but when you see me being extra observant, it, there's a reason. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the order of the Pharisees, and he was named the victorious one. The, word, the name Nicodemus means to be victorious. A ruler of the Jews... This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You know, I like to stress the significance of this man's name because of the many Pharisees that Jesus encountered on a day-to-day -day basis. Even the ones that confronted him repeatedly and openly, there weren't, there weren't many names that were named. I'm not even sure that Caiaphas, the high priest, was of the order of the Pharisees. I, I don't believe that we have enough evidence to say that he was of the order of the Pharisees because I think he could have emerged from another one of the orders. You know, we have the sects of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then you have some people who begin to assume more like a liberal or independent identity by the time they become part of the Sanhedrin. But we have all of those people who had parts to play in the time of Jesus and in the ministry of the Lord, but not many names were mentioned. But Nicodemus was mentioned. 
And I like to always stress the name Nicodemus as one who is victorious because every now and again we see people who seem to be winning at life who still do not have life. You know, because you have many people that God has put on your heart to witness to the gospel, but if you're not careful, there are times where in the angle from which the enemy comes to discourage you from preaching the gospel to them, is the enemy starts to say to you, look at them, they seem to be even better than you. Why do you want to tell them about your Jesus? They seem to be doing fine without that your Jesus. They own the company that you work for. They've been married for 47 and a half years. Their children are well behaved. Satan begins to point out all of these things to you. And sometimes it's even just your own complex that is pointing those things out to you to make you feel like this is already a Nicodemus. This man is winning at life. What have I to offer him? And you know, people who are already winning at life want to associate with other people who are winning, at least from their perspective. And so Nicodemus came and said, well, you're, you're, you're the man. We, we know no one can do what things you do unless God is with him. Why would he say that? He was saying that because he wanted Jesus to admit that God was with Nicodemus. <laughs> I come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, and I want to say to you that um, you must know your way around in the presence of God because several things were going on in this place while the worship was on. But I tell you, let me tell you, two of the things that really, um, that, that, that hit me and, and, and would stay with me for a while. I was standing here and suddenly, without feeling a weight, I felt like I was dropping continually. From an erect posture, I was standing erect. I went and I became a little bent over until I was literally as squashed up or as bent and rolled up as I can be. But it wasn't like I felt a weight, but then I just knew that I was in a way being pushed down without feeling the force that was pushing me down. And I inquired of the Lord as I was in his presence. I was not in another building Physically, I was in this same building that you were in. But I was able to access other rooms that make up the presence of God that we get to experience. Or at least that measure of the presence of God that we were experiencing in this place. So I say that to encourage you that don't let moments like this pass you by. Believe the word of God, not your emotions. Believe the word of God, not your traditions. The word of God says, Jesus himself speaking, he says, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there. And that is the reason why the moment I set foot in here, I know certain faces that have borne fruits of dedication to the Lord. People that I know who come here not because of aggrandizement, people who come in here not because of advertisement, but people who come in here because of the fact that they have a commitment to the Lord. You know, there are times when we see people who come in here because they just got a real estate license and they're looking for fresh clients and so they go to churches and they try to be friendly with people. They're not here for the Lord, they're here for mammon. Maybe not here because this is communion house. But we've seen even in our midst in the past. And so I have come to learn by the instruction of the Holy Spirit. It might be just me, but it feels really hot in here. So if it's, if it's everybody, you may want to do something about the air. You see, the thing is, I have come to learn that when Jesus says a thing, when we have a, 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 an insight given to us freely in the word of God, that is what matters more than anything else. And so it doesn't matter if you have been to certain churches or been to certain fellowships and felt nothing that you could call the presence of God. It doesn't even matter. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Tell your emotions and tell yourself that sometimes you lie and the truth is not in you. 
That's what the Bible says. The Bible says if we say that we do not have sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. And so I have come to learn that regardless of how I may have felt once before or how other people may have felt, it is the word of God that holds true. And if Jesus says that when you are gathered in my name, I will be there in your midst, I have come to look, I have come to learn to look for people in whose lives I have seen the dedication to the presence of God. And whenever those people are present in a room, I'm like, Father, I can see two and maybe even more of us who are here for you. We're not here to look for a job. We're not here for any other reason but to engage the man of Galilee. And so the moment I see that, I begin to release my spirit. I begin to loosen myself in God's presence. I begin to allow myself to become extra sensitive to whatever winds may blow or whatever presences may pass. I begin to allow myself to recognize in whose presence I am and whose present I am. You see, because when I come before the presence of God, I am the present, I am the sacrifice, I am the gift. I need to recognize that and I need to do it so consciously that I do not miss a thing. And so here I was, knowing where I was, so as soon as I felt that I was being pressed down without feeling the weight, I said, it's the Lord because his burden is light and his yoke is easy. So when the Lord is compelling you to do a thing, you will not feel the weight because his burden is light, but you will know that there is a push. Because his yoke is easy, you will not feel like you have been compelled. If anything at all, you will feel like you have been loved into action. And the moment I felt that, as I was getting on my knees, I said, Lord, it is you. He said, yeah, it is I. And you know what he said to me? He says, I have come to answer you. And that very moment, my, my, I was broken within me because pretty much all day, at the back of my mind, I kept saying, Lord, I want more of you. And if you're going to get more of him, there has to be less of you. I must decrease so that he can increase. Before I left the house, one of the things that I was professing, and you see the beauty of meditating on the word of God is when you meditate to a point, you reach saturation and you have no choice but to begin to make confessions. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're struggling to confess the word of God, particularly before trouble comes, it is because you are not yet meditating enough on the same because you cannot be saturated with the word without an overflow. And I started to, my wife was asking me to come and eat. I was hungry, I wanted to eat, but then just involuntarily, Subconsciously, I started to say within myself, I do not stand upon my works, but I stand upon your grace. I started to say to myself, Lord, I meditate more on what you have done as opposed to on the things that I do. You see, because it is very easy for us in our egotistical nature of the fallen man to think more of what we are able to accomplish than what has already been accomplished for you. And so we begin to qualify and disqualify ourselves based on whatever it is that we are able to contribute rather than recognize how to, in humility, submit to the sacrifice that is the once and for all sacrifice. Do you know the reason why the Bible says that there is no further requirement? Because there is no further sacrifice. It would be unjust for God to require more from you when he already said that Jesus was the ultimate and the final sacrifice. But guess what? Religion is the biggest bondage that we carry. Religion is the strongest hold that Satan has on this world because religion has taught us to measure ourselves by the works of our hands to then determine what we are qualified for when it comes to the benevolence of God. And so I started to say, Lord, I stand not on my works, but on your grace. I look more into, I focus more upon what you have done rather than the things that I am able to do. And that was just maybe an hour or two before service and I was here and the Lord says, I have come to answer you. And I was decreased before him that he might be increased. I say to you today, check yourself, wherever you might be. 
check yourself wherever you might be because the Lord was here. Some of us, we may say that the Lord was here when, and we knew it not, but that, did, that does not in any way mean that he hasn't touched you. Have a holy expectation. I will tell you a little bit more about the experiences that I have, that I had in God's presence while I was here. You see, as I stayed in here, receiving this dealing of the Lord, I knew when he said to me to arise, but I was a little hesitant. I was like, man, I, I'm loving this experience. You know how we want to build a tabernacle once we have had a transfiguration experience. It might not even be you having the experience, but you just want to sympathetically build a, temp, a tent. Remember Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John were three of the they were three of the most prominent disciples of Jesus while they were still disciples. By the time they became apostles, we saw different levels of accelerations in the lives of the people. Even people who were like doubting Thomas, he came from the back and he outran everybody else. He was the, the, the apostle that traveled the furthest away from where Jesus was crucified. Same Thomas. <laughs> Thomas that never believed anything. You understand what I mean? But while they were disciples, the three most prominent were Peter, James, and John. And it doesn't, it's not rocket science. Their prominence was directly attributed to their curiosity. They were three of the most um, inclusive people when it comes to what Jesus was doing. They were so nosy that Jesus recognized them. And James and John, they got their nosiness from their mom because their mother was beyond nosy. She wanted to see Jesus' cabinet when he becomes glorified in his father's kingdom. So when you see people who are nosy, don't judge them. Borrow from them a little bit because the Bible says he knows who quests to know, who follows to know. I believe it's the reason why the women will prophesy at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because women always want to know what is going on. Not just in your head, but in your phone. Not just in your phone, but in your wallet. Not just... They want to know, not just in your own life, but in the life of, your, of, of that mother-in-law. They want to know what, what is going on. And don't judge them. Maybe you want to emulate them because we are not supposed to be ignorant people. We're supposed to know because the only way to know, according to the word of God, is to quest to know. Because the people who do not have a quest for knowledge, who are given knowledge, they waste it and squander it because they do not know the value of what they may have received. But Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, they says, Lord, we, this is you. We kind of can tell that it is you, even though it, it was the transfigured Jesus. You know? And then they saw Moses and Elijah. I mean, of course, they knew who they were supernaturally because it wasn't like they were alive and there were, there were no pictures. So it wasn't like they had seen a picture of, of Moses and Elijah on Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica. They hadn't seen, there were no pictures. So they just knew that, okay, if this is Jesus, this must be Moses and Elijah. I don't know how they knew, but they knew somehow. And they said, we we're going to build a tabernacle. I say that because some of us are where we're at because we chose to build a tabernacle over the last experience. And when God brings a new experience that doesn't look like that one, you tell the angels to keep moving. You know, because there are times we're in, the way that I've enjoyed, I mean, the, the, I mean, the kind of experience that I've had today, this was me in the past. When Tuesday comes, I would want to have the same kind of experience. And when it doesn't happen, I will get angry and God will be talking to me and I wouldn't answer. I'll be throwing tantrums. Like, why would you give me a taste of your presence like that on Saturday? And Tuesdays come now and I'm getting angry at every song that is being sung. And I can't even get my mind to focus. Things like that happen, but I have learned to shake myself from the beast, to shake off the beast rather, into the fire. I have learned not to build a tabernacle around such experiences. I let God choose the way that he wants to reveal himself to me. You know, because the thing about the glory of God is that it is so present, but it is also invisible. It is as invisible as it is present because you can only see it from a given perspective at any given time. You know why? The physics behind the presence of God is that it is light that has no variance. <laughs> let, us, let us talk physics a little bit. You see, the light that is shining from any one of these lamps can be seen because 
it bounces off other objects. So it diffuses, right? Because this light has variance. It, it, it can vary its path when it hits an object. But the Bible says God is that light, that unapproachable light. That has no variance. With him, there is no variance or shadow of turning. Because God is the kind of light that does not bounce off, but that penetrates. And so because God is the eternally penetrating light, for you to see him, because his glory appears to be a narrow stream of light from most perspectives, unless he takes you to the place wherein you can see it in its splendor. The splendor of the glory of God essentially refers to the spread of the glory of God in the dimension of access. And God was present on the mountain with Moses. The Bible says that Moses spoke with God as a man would speak to his friend face to face. And yes, he didn't see God. You know, someone can, when I'm talking to somebody face to face, how do I know? Because I can feel where the voice is coming from. I can see their facial expression. I can see all of that. That is face to face. Moses spoke to God face to face, but he still couldn't see God. Until God took him and set him on a particular place. Because God alone knows where you can access the glory from. And so he placed Moses at a particular place. He says, you stay here and do not move. The last guy moved and that's why he's not here. You got this job because the last guy moved. The testimony of the Lord Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see, it's interesting how the person who needed to hear that stood up in the spirit when I said it. Because where God wanted them to be is not where they're at. Simply because where God told them to stay, they didn't stay. They moved. And the Bible says, let another take his place. Moses, God told Moses, do not move. And Moses stayed there. As terrified as he might have been, he stayed. And then God passed so that he can see his lateral posture. Because that's as much as the man can handle. Anything more than that, it will be absorbed into that light. Um, let me not bore you with the physics of that, but for anyone who might be interested, the way it works, the reason why the Bible says no one sees God and lives is because God is that eternally penetrating light and because you are made of the same component as him, the moment you see him and you be, behold that glory in the direction of his movement or his motion, it absorbs you into its stream and you cease to be. If I take a spoon of water from the ocean, it's only going to remain, if I, let's, even take, let's even say a cup of water, right? If I go to the ocean and I scoop a cup of water, it can only remain a cup of water as long as it's in the cup. If I pour it back into the ocean, I will never be able to recover that same water because it is from the ocean. If it gets exposed to the flow of the ocean, it will blend right back in, never to be recovered again. And that is the reason why the Bible says no one sees God and lives. Because the moment you see him, because you are made in his image and in his likeness, and your very essence is a function of his being, you will be absorbed back into the eternal stream, and you will be no more. And that is the reason why he said to Moses, you will see my behind. I'm flowing in this direction, so you can catch a glimpse. Because if you see me from where I'm flowing into, I will wash you along with me, and there will be no more Moses, and the children of Israel will, might as well just go back to Egypt. And so, I was here and the Lord said to me, it is I, I have come to answer your prayers. And so I stood there and I just wanted to continue to engage. And I wanted to continue to soak in that experience and the Lord said to me, get up. I didn't get up. I was thinking about it. I, I, I brought it under advisement, as they say, which is what we do. God tells you to do a thing and you're considering it. Wow. How important are we? You know, we do that. God tells you, I want you to forgive that person. And you're like, okay, I'll think about it. You want to check on me again next Sunday? See where I'm at? When the Lord says a thing, let us, let us yield and let us be led by his Holy Spirit. Let us move with the cloud. You see what I mean? But guess what? There are certain times when God knows your dilemma. 
he knows I was enjoying that thing too much to give it up. And so he sent me help. Because one of the things that I said to him was this. I said, I know certain things that need to be fixed. I said, but Lord, I choose not to fix them because I want your fix. I said, I'm just going to remain as I am until my change comes. The man of God said, all the days of my vain life, I will wait until my change comes. Because some of us are too busy trying to change ourselves when in fact we are not the potter. We are just clay. Good luck to that lump of clay that is trying to mold itself from a teacup into a saucer. You will make effort, but you just might not make progress. And even when you make progress, you will not make perfection because it has not been given to you to take the place of the one who says, I am. So let him be God and you just be clay. I would rather just be clay and wait and let him mold me. But the thing that I will not do is I'm not going to leave his platter. Because some of us were clay, but we wobble away from the table of the Lord because we're not able to wait for him anymore. And then you wobble and you fall into the ground and you pick up dirt and people trample you on the food and you blame God for it. And God was like, I put you on the table. You could have just waited for me. It doesn't matter how shapeless and how void you think you are. We don't know how long the earth was without form and void. We don't know. But when the time came, the Bible says the Lord showed up and he says, let there be light. You see, but some of us, we can't wait for two days. We can't even wait for two years. Some of us waiting for 10 years, it sounds like it's too much. But the Lord is saying, I am the God of eternity. If I tell you to wait for 100 years, what is that to you? Just wait. If you die on me, I will wake you up again. Ask Lazarus. Because sometimes we think of the ability of God from the perspective of our own inabilities. And we're thinking, God, if I don't marry by 32, no one's going to marry me. And God is saying, if I want you to marry at 62, you'll be more beautiful then than you are now. And you will be able to have as many children as I want you to have. If you're in doubt, pick up the phone and call Sarah. The Bible says Abraham did not consider the deadness of his own body and the deadness of... Do you know what that means? Abraham's body was already dead. He was just laying next to his wife, no action. And he was still believing God for a child. Oh, I bet you never thought about it like that, really, did you? No. The Bible says he did not consider his own body dead, not the deadness of Sarah's womb. So it wasn't like they were trying in the natural. They were trying exclusively by faith. The deadness of his body, just because we're not all adults in here, I'm not going to explain too much. But if you know, you know, the man was laying there by faith. The Bible says he did not consider the deadness of his own body, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he believed God and he will rejoice. And so what he will do is he will go to his wife's bedside and begin to rejoice because of the promises of God. One way or the other, this thing is going to happen. And here you are. You keep telling yourself, oh, if I don't have this, I cannot get that. Who told you? There is only one requirement, and that is for you to find favor. Because once you have found favor with God, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you have or what you do not have. You are now operating with all of who he is. And the last time I checked, God is more than enough. So I, wanted to encourage, I want to encourage you to revisit your dreams. Revisit the things that the Lord ignited in your heart that seem to be too far-fetched. I'm not asking you to become ambitious. I'm only saying, be humble. And let me say that again. You know, most times when people hear things like that, they're like, oh, this man is teaching ambition. He must be one of those motivational speakers. No. I am telling you to believe, not to perform. Jesus says, only believe. He takes a lot of humility on your part as a human being to trust God. Because you are made in his image and in his likeness, your creative instinct wants to fix the problem. And many of us don't even like asking for help. And so God is standing there with all the power in the heaven and on the earth, and you're like, I, I got this, God. If I just worry about it for four more days, it's going to happen. And God is like, but you've been worrying about it for 14 weeks and nothing's happened. Why don't you try something other than worry? Why don't you try just a little faith? Even if it's like a mustard seed. And that will usher the whole of heaven in. We're just waiting. We just need a little faith.
almost like give us an excuse to show you what's possible. But we're so busy trusting in our own abilities. So my wife came up here to pray. And what was the first thing she said? The moment God had said it once, the Bible says once did God say it, but twice did I hear it. He told me got up and I was still contemplating getting up and my wife came up in here and she said, what Psalm did you read again? Psalms 100, is it the message translation? Oh. But guess what? The Bible says, be emulators of those who do good. I've just seen a freshly poured cup of coffee and I want one. No, no, Charles got me, thank you. I appreciate that. So here is the deal. She said... On your feet. I heard it twice that the excellency of power belongs to God. I got up on my feet and I'm like, okay, what else do you want to do, Lord? Because apparently you're the one running this show. I'm just here for the ride. So speed up, slow down, whatever you want to do. I'm all yours now. I am your captive now. Do what you will with me. I don't like the message translation. Read the message translation. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, he did it for my sake. So it doesn't matter whether you thought that scripture was for you. It's for me. It totally was for me. And so I took that in. So I've shared with you, with you two things. I will save the third one for later. So that we're not here until tomorrow. Wow, what a vote of confidence. Wow, so much faith in the man of God. I said, we'll be here until tomorrow. She was like, <laughs> indeed. So let's quickly wrap up on this John chapter 3 because we've got a couple of other things that I would like to share with us by the Holy Spirit, of course. But here we looked at Nicodemus and the Holy Spirit would have me stop. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you. And give you an insight into what it means to be winning at life and yet not have the life of God. That was the person of Nicodemus. So he came to Jesus and he was bragging. He was like, um, because you know what they say that it takes one to know one. And so he looked at Jesus and he was like, if you're doing these things, I can tell you that God has to be with you because I mean, we know how this thing works. And immediately Jesus, because Jesus does this all the time, right? People will approach him, say one thing, but he knows they mean the other. Like the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said what? Oh, good master. And Jesus was like, there's no need to patronize me. None is good but the Father. So that way, all of his resume that he wanted to recite to Jesus, he closed it very quickly because Jesus is like, whatever you want to say, it don't matter. Only God is good. And so this one came to Jesus and he says, so we know God is with you. And Jesus immediately knew what he was saying was that there was, there was a quest within him, even though he seemed to man to be winning deep within him, he knew he needed help. And Jesus just answered his spirit. He did not bother with his ego. Can you say to yourself, Jesus, help me. Please ignore my ego. And talk to my need. Because sometimes we have true needs. But we want to masquerade the need to God. We don't want God to know how bad things are. Let me tell you what is interesting about God. Not only does he know how bad things are, he knows how worse they will get before they get better. So just when you're trying to hide from God how bad things really are, you want to give God that impression that you got things under, you know, control. It's pointless. Just tell him, look, there is nothing that I can hide from you. David was like, he said, even if I get up on the wings of the dawn and fly to the ends of the earth, he says, your love will be there waiting for me. There is no place that I can hide from your love. I can only make it through your love. Kayla, please come back quickly. Not now. If you need to go somewhere, go, because I need to talk about your testimony in the next two minutes. No pressure. One twenty seconds. <laughs> you know, every time somebody says no pressure, brace up. That is pressure. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, verse 3 of John chapter 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what does the Bible say in verse 5? 
Verse 5, Jesus explains even further. He says, unless a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is spirit, not just water. Because what you cannot see, you cannot enter. So I started us up on Tuesday talking to us about the significance and the importance of being able to project beyond the mundane to see the possibilities of infinite, infinite intelligence or the realm of the spirit, as we like to call it, before we can actually begin to access the power of God. My wife came up and she encouraged us that we need to use the power of our imagination. I said this on Tuesday, that many of us have not even learned how to use our imagination and we're believing God for prophetic insight. You want to begin to have visions and you want to go into trances. You want to have dreams. But what about the imagination that God has even given you the power to wield? Have you brought that into submission to the obedience of Christ? When the Bible says, let your attention be on things above and not on things beneath. Do you know that every meditation begins with imagination? Because if your meditation just begins accidentally, then you will not know how to work it. And God does not want you to be an accidental believer. He wants you to be an intentional believer. And that is the reason why God allows for us to go through the rigors of learning how things work in the realm of the spirit. Because line has to be upon line. Step has to be upon a step. And precept has to be upon precept. When you see me come in here and we have not even sung the first song and I'm already shaking like a leaf on the water. It's not because of the fact that I accidentally stumble into the portal that takes me to the presence of God. It's because I have learned the rudiments of access. And the rudiments of access begins with you seeking God with all of your heart. It begins with you doing what you can do. It begins with you making sure that you make the time. Making sure that you use what you have the ability to use. Your mouth, your knees, your imagination. Bring all of those things to bear and stay there until something happens. And you find yourself being able to transition into the realm of the spirit in the twinkle of an eye. Not because you have now become familiar. It's because now you have become seasoned. The Bible says they have their senses sharpened by reason of use. You've seen me just call people and prophesy over them. Just call them forth and prophesy. But you didn't see me when I would spend three hours just praying for one person in tongues. You see what I mean? But we have to start from there. The Bible says, seek him and you will find him. You begin with what you have. You bring it to the table and let it be a demonstration of your dedication to what you want to get. And the moment you make it a habit, the moment you are seasoned in it, then it begins to work for you. I said this, the Holy Spirit said something else. I wanted to laugh, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> when I said it will begin to work for you, the Holy Spirit said to me, remember to tell them that they have to work for it, for it to work for them. I say it in that way because that's what he said. And that's what somebody here needs to hear. You want the presence of God to work for you, work for it. I said at the beginning that it is not by power nor by might. It is not by your ability. But working for it is preparing yourself to receive that which is freely available. I cannot earn access to the presence of God. So when I say work for it, I'm not working to earn access. But I'm working to prepare myself to receive that access. Because it's a free gift. It's been given to everybody. So if you're not working in it, then that means you are not allowing yourself to be positioned where God wants to give you access. Let me say this, still using the analogy of Moses. Where was Moses when God took him and set him on the side of the rock? Where was he? He was on the mountain. How did he get there? Did God bring him to the mountain? He came to the mountain by himself. He crawled up that mountain, a man that was about 100 years old at the time, maybe even 120, because that was close to the end of his ministry. And he went up the side of the mountain. It took him, we don't even know how many days. He was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. No food, no water. Because they hadn't invented Yeti by that time, so he couldn't take with him some coffee. There was nothing. He went up there, no food, no water. 
Even his associate that was much younger than him, maybe about 20 years younger. I don't remember the figures. Maybe Ryan can tell us. He said to Moses after a while, boss, keep going. I'll wait for you right here. The dude could not go any further. But Moses was like, I can smell him. But I need more than just a fragrance. I need to be swimming in the robe of his presence. I am not going to settle for whatever is happening here at the foot of the mountain. I need to get in the thickness of that cloud. Oh yeah, God spoke to me on Tuesday. But that was Tuesday last week and I haven't heard him since then. That is not good enough for me. I want to be able to hear him every time. Because the Bible says that God doesn't stop speaking. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. Why would God stop speaking? When the Bible says also that he upholds all things by the word of his power. If God stops uttering words, things will cease to exist. Because how do you create the next moment without the word of God? Because there was nothing made that was made without the word of God. Before you are able to wink... You need a moment to separate this wink from the previous wink. And only the word of God can create such moments. And that is the reason why the spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. So we should not have trouble hearing God, the one who speaks so clearly and so loudly. The Bible says his voice is like what? It's like thunder upon many waters. So the only reason why we can't hear him is because we're not paying attention and we have too many things blocking our ears. And then, of course, when you're close to other gods, you hear them more loudly then you hear God because who you're close to is who you hear more loudly. You understand what I mean? And so when other things are close to your heart, you know, when your pride and how, how people see you, what people think of you, if it's more important to you than what God is saying, then that's what you're going to hear. That's why you keep adjusting yourself. You keep doing things to make yourself look a certain way because all you can see or hear is your own vanity because you think so much of what people think. But when you get to that point where it doesn't matter what people think because you just want to know that you have heaven's approval, then you begin to hear God's instructions. They will be coming to you in a steady flow. It's going to be more steady than the navigation system in your car. God can lead you better than that. I'm going to close this for, or actually leave it open for a while. I'm, I need to say this. When we started here singing today, I don't know where these guys found that song from. Alan and the band, I don't know where y'all found it from. But that was a song from my childhood. And whenever we sang that song, we danced and danced and danced. In fact, I was like, man, I told Alan after the, the worship, I said I was in the spirit of David when y'all began to sing that song. Because I think it was David who, who, who composed that song. He, who said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. When we were children, I remember there was someone who came to our children's church classroom and said to us, the Lord has made a day. He has done his part. Your part is to choose to rejoice. Because that word says, I will rejoice. So you may not feel like rejoicing. It may not even look like a rejoicing kind of day. But the Bible says you need to choose to rejoice. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, rejoice again. I say rejoice. And so when I heard that song, I started to rejoice in the presence of God. I was dancing in his presence because I believe everything the word of God says. The Bible says to dance before the Lord. The Bible says to clap our hands. The Bible says to make a joyfulness before the Lord. Shouting and acting not too cool in the presence of God is not a Nigerian thing. It's just a Bible thing. You know, because I've been in places. I remember there was a church where I used to serve, my wife and I. And um, we were called and told that I couldn't be screaming hallelujah anymore from the pulpit because it sounds archaic. That I wasn't, it wasn't posh enough. Which I understand because the other guys will come in and they'll be like, oh, isn't it so awesome this morning? Come on, do you not just love the weather today? Oh man, this weather is it's Jesus kind of weather. Come on, tap your neighbor and say 72 degrees for me all day. And everyone is like, oh, 72 degrees for me all day. But I will come on the microphone and I will say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And only the old school people will respond because the other young people don't even know what I'm talking about. And so they have to call me and lecture me and tell me that I was not being sophisticated enough. So what did I do? I took my leave simply because give me that old time religion. Give me that old time really. The Bible says do not remove the ancient landmarks. 
Do not remove the ancient landmarks. And so the way things were done in Bible times have to be done again today because God hasn't changed. And so if David danced to the point wherein his wife was like, now you're a disgrace to the throne. The woman said it was a disgrace to the throne because he was king and he danced so much that his robe of honor fell off of him. The woman was oblivious to what David was doing. David was doing a holy exchange. He was exchanging the royal garment of a temporary throne for an eternal throne. And that was the reason why when he let go of that robe, the Lord said to him, he says, thy throne is now forever and the scepter of your kingdom will be of righteousness. He says, you will never lack a man on the throne because you have honored me this day. He said to David, he says, you will never lack a man on the throne. In fact, when my seed is coming, which is the seed of the woman, when the Messiah comes, I will make sure he comes through your lineage to further guarantee that you will have a king forever. In your lineage. And the woman was there. And you know what God did? God removed the woman from eternity. How did he do it? She became barren. When you can no longer produce, how do you continue? Because the woman did not, she missed the moment of exchange. David ex exchanged the temporal for the eternal in the place of, he never said a prayer like that that we know of. If anything at all, he just wanted to complete his life. He says, I will not die but live to declare the works of God. But he wasn't asking God, oh, give me eternal life. Give me, let my children be king forever. No, he just went before the Lord and danced like he just didn't care. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why we need to do these things. Oh, someone says, oh, it's Old Testament, New Testament. We don't dance. I don't know what kind of New Testament believer you are, but Paul and Silas were as New Testament as they come. Paul and Barnabas were so New Testament, they never took their tags off. They were like that New Testament. And the Bible says they prayed and they did what? They sang and they danced off the shackles. So I want to encourage you, be emulators of those who do good. You see, when you see me here, it gives you an insight into what, I've, what things I've learned to do in my closet, in my home, when no one sees me. Just dance before the Lord. Sing before the Lord. Let me tell you something. There are certain problems in our lives that does not require therapy. Let me say that again. There are certain issues that we go through that does not require counseling. It just requires for you to open your mouth and shout. And shout. And just scream. And then when you're done, you feel like something's left you. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. So now let us begin. Well, let's continue. Because when I say begin, someone may be afraid that we're going to. But when I say begin, what I meant was I want to begin to tell you the things that the Lord said to me before the meeting started about today being the day of deliverance. As I was getting ready, the Lord revealed to me a strategy that the enemy borrowed from Jesus that he's been using against believers. And so once you become aware of that strategy, it's no longer going to be an effective strategy against you because Satan does not have his own strategies. There was nothing made that was what? Made without the word. And that word was the one that became flesh and would be held his glory and it was the glory of the Son of God. And so everything that is made is made by the Lord Jesus, the word of God. And so Satan can only borrow from him. And that's why when you look at the way Satan tempted Jesus, he was tempting Jesus using scripture. When he tempted Adam and Eve, what was he doing? He was using what God said, just trying to manipulate it in such a way as to confuse the poor innocent people that they were at the time. You understand what I mean? And so I want to tell you the strategy, and then I want to tell you how Satan's been using it, and, and declare over you by the grace of God, oh, thank you, Jesus. I've been, I've been waiting, I've been begging the Lord kind of like secretly in my heart since the worship was over to see if he can let me tell you what I'm about to tell you. Okay, ooh, all righty. Let me tell you something else first. I'll tell you the strategy. Jesus says that, oh, wow, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> hmm. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, I want you to lay hold of this moment and let it be your breakthrough moment. Let it be that moment that you're delivered from doubt. Let this be the moment that you're delivered from continually sinking into the same pit. Let this be the moment that your cripple is healed. In every area that you have been incapacitated, this is the moment of deliverance. This is a sacred moment. Father, thank you because of this time that we have come into. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. We have come to the pool. And your healing is in the water. I want you to call to mind right now, whatever it is that has defeated you. Whatever it is that you have struggled with. Your lameness. Call it to mind right now. If you're a student and your lameness is that you can't read with concentration, bring it to the pool today. If you're a business person and you just can't seem to be profitable, bring it to the pool right now. Whoever you are, whatever your lameness is, bring it to the pool right now because it's about to be stirred. Jesus, Rakumdi Tiando, Aliababam Telekuds, Haruski Silefiadi. You are healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Receive joy and become joyful. Embrace peace and never let go. Your sleepless nights are over. The nightmares have come to an end. I speak over you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that anxiety that has troubled you, you know sometimes it will go, sometimes it will return. But in recent times, it has even heightened. It's been on the increase. If that is you in particular, if you've had to deal with panic attacks and you've been a bit more anxious in recent times, especially in the last eight weeks than you normally would be, I want you to come forward and I want to pray with you even some more. But I can tell you now that so many things like that that are wrong with us have been fixed. That anxiety, and let me say this, you're not coming forward because of me. You're coming forward because of you. Because I am only a messenger to deliver the mind of God. So there is a woman that I see. I would not call you out because to be honest, you have to want it. You have to believe it. And you have to recognize it. If I bring it to you, you will leave it here and go away. You would only take it with you if you come and get it. Hear me and hear me good. I am not creating a condition for the blessing of God because there are no conditions other than for you to believe. But what I am saying is you need to hunger and thirst after righteousness if you are going to be filled. I need to see you. I need to have you. You need to be here to receive it. And my heart breaks for you. I just can't believe that you will not come and grab what is yours. But it's all right. Because the faithfulness of God would allow for you to have a reflection upon this moment and know that if only you had come out, the enemy would not have had a chance to get you again. I commend you in the mighty name of Jesus and the grace of God to believe what this moment really is. And I'm going to tell you what this moment is again. The Lord says it is the day of deliverance. The Lord has chosen this moment to be the moment that he delivers you from that which has troubled you. From the panic, from the anxiety. The Lord has not given unto you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love of power and of a sound mind. And you need to kick fear out because fear loves you so much because it hates you that much. And he wants to see to it that, he, that it reduces you 
to his hellish level, even though you are meant to be of heavenly prosperity. You, your life should prosper in righteousness, peace, and joy. Soundness of mind is yours. So today you must be ready to kick it because the Lord is bringing you out of it and you cannot stay there anymore because you have stayed there for too long. You have paid your dues and he has paid the price. It's time for you to come to a new outpost of heaven where there is righteousness, peace, and joy, where you can fully function in your sound mind. I want to hold your hand up, woman, the one next to Sister Barbara. I, I don't remember your name, but please, if you would come up, I want to hold up your hand. Please remind me your name again. Nikki, you are that woman, and I'm glad that you finally came forward because my heart was breaking when I saw you still sitting there because the Lord has given you a mind that you have not been able to use because too many thoughts trouble you. The littlest things make your feet shake and tremble. But the Lord says, I have not given to her the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Any form of resentment that has been written upon the walls of your heart that you see and take instructions from is wiped out this very moment. Because your Lord and Savior Jesus he has wiped out every handwriting of the ordinances that are against you. That illusion that is on the wall of your heart, given instructions to you, is defeated today. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I declare over you today as the Lord has given me a footing in the courts of heaven to say upon you today, woman of God, that you will harbor fear no more. Your thoughts will be clear. Because you have a sound mind. Your intentions will be pure because you have love. Even the love of your heavenly father as your nature. And no longer will you be timid. No wait for others to get there. No wait for others to agree. No wait for others to move because he has given you power. So you will move now when he says move. It doesn't matter who is moving with you. The Lord is with you and that is all the power that you need. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because you brought this woman here today because you have brought her out of where she's been to set her foot upon the merry clay and to turn a new leaf for her. And the Lord says to you, he says, I have brought you here and given you a clean slate today. He says, let us write with the pen of love the story of my goodness in your life. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. The Lord is drawing you close. That's what he's telling you. Beautiful for situation. It's the joy of the whole earth. It's Mount Zion side of the northern city of the great king. It's Mount Zion side. The Lord says it is Mount Zion. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. He says, I need to unpack that to you. I want to help you unpack it. Nikki, if you would look at me, the Lord has brought you to Zion. You know why? Because if you don't see Zion, you do not become the mountain that God intends for you to be. But when the Lord brings you in the spirit and sets you on a place to stay and you behold the mountains of Zion, then you begin to see what he intends for you to be. He says, I have made you like one of those mountains and you are not to be moved. You are supposed to be as resilient as those mountains. You're supposed to be a fortress for other people. You're supposed to be one that elevates other people. You are supposed to be one person whose thoughts others can stand on to see hope and live. And the Lord says, I bring you to Zion the day that you may see the rock that you are made of. Yeah. What a shoulder you have in the realm of the spirit and you don't even know it. Your shoulder is not for evil birds to perch on and be whispering lies to you. Your shoulder is for others to stand so that they may see Jesus and see the love of God. That they may be able to get a glimpse of the river of life that flows from the presence of God. That comes from beneath the throne of God. Others need to hear you and hear peace. They need to hear you and hear joy. Simply because the Lord has chosen to make himself manifest through you. It's not a burden to you, it's an enablement. 
give him, give him thanks. Just praise him. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. The Lord Jesus said to me, he said, they watched me do it. They copied it. And they are winning in some people's lives, even though I have given those people victory. But Satan seems to be winning in their lives. He's winning in their lives. Not seems. He said to me, he's winning in their lives. And you know why? Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like children in the marketplaces. He says, we have played for you and we have danced for you. And still you refused our advances. Children in the marketplaces flocking and frolicking together. And the Lord said to me, Satan has children in the minds of many of my brothers and sisters. And these children are thoughts and notions that have been with you since you were a child and they refuse to allow for you to enjoy benefits of being an adult. They are behaviors that have lingered from your childhood, limitations that have lingered from your childhood. Satan has instrumented his familiar spirits to remain like the little friends that you can trust. Little friends that you have fun with. Little friends that you want to spend your time with. Instead of you spending your time believing what the word of God says, you keep spending your time listening to those voices. They are familiar spirits and the Lord has come to deliver you from them today. These voices no longer need to control your life. These voices, you see, let me give you an example of those voices. Those voices when you were a little child, they recognize a particular kind of person that they don't like. And that is the reason why even now as an adult, when you see a particular person or someone begins to talk in a certain way, you're like, I don't like people like that. It wasn't you who said it. It's those little children. They're familiar spirits. Don't be deceived. They're not children. They're wicked spirits of old. But they take the form of man. But it is time for you to tell them you are not playing with them anymore. They were the voices that came to console you when you were abused as a child. And they built a tabernacle around the trauma and they would not allow your life to progress from the trauma because they keep telling you all of the things that happened at that time. They make songs about your pain so that you can remain in that circle with them. And the Lord is saying it's time for you to get up and look in the mirror and see the glory of Christ and tell those friends you do not play with them anymore. Shake yourself from the alliance of destruction. The voice of familiar spirits, the voices that have haunted my brothers and sisters, particularly those ones who are standing here with me today. I speak to you in the name that is above every other name, in the name of the Messiah. I say to you by the authority that has been given to me as one who has been given a place in the courts of heaven. I have a binding declaration over you to say to you, your place is no longer because you were not planted in them by my heavenly father. Be uprooted today and be cast into the sea. Perish like the swine, never to return. These ones are free today to think like adults. They're free today to think like friends of God. They are free today to think like the ones for whom Christ died, putting away every childishness in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Apostle Paul said, and I want to encourage you to say it like Paul said. He said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. <laughs> I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. He said, but now I put away childish things. Walk away from that toy room. Walk away from that company of friends. Walk into the light and be the man and the woman that God wants you to be. Able to make sacrifices. Able to make decisions. Able to take responsibilities. And able to... Be an agent of the glory of your heavenly father. And on top of it all, the Bible says inheritances are for sons. Healing as an inheritance has eluded you simply because you have been showing your face as a little child. The Bible says when an offspring is but a child, he differs not from a servant. But when he is grown and becomes a son, the inheritance is brought to him. And he receives the inheritance. And so a lot of the things that have eluded you in your life, the kind of consistency that you want to see in your life. The, in fact, some of you know, in fact, I, I'm going to say this because it's, it's, it's several people. Because what I saw 
was I saw a group of people standing and they're wearing something very similar. Every one of them seemed to be in the same shade of, 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 of garment, like brownish gray. Every one of you are standing together. And, and the angel of the Lord who was instructing you was saying to you that it is time for you to recognize who you are in Christ Jesus so that your true friends can come into your life. You know you're missing people in your life. You can tell. Because there are certain times that you want to say certain things, but the people around you are not the recipient of those things. And you're like, I feel alone even though I'm in the company of people. The Lord says you need to see yourself for who you are so that you can identify the company that you belong to. God bless you. Please be seated. In the mighty name of Jesus. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. The beautiful for situation is the joy of the whole earth. It's Mount Zion side of the northern city of the great king. It's Mount Zion side of the northern city of the great king. I am glad that that song came to me again because the word that God has for you, Nikki, is part of the fulfillment of promise in these last days wherein the Bible says, and it was one of the scriptures that we received actually when we started Communion House, that the mountain of the Lord's house will be upon the mountain. And the Lord says that his sons will inhabit the mountains of Zion. What that means is your deliverance will never be in isolation. The Lord will cause for people to be raised around you who will receive a similar victory of peace. Because it's not just your mountain that will stand in the middle of the wilderness by itself. No, it will stand in a range of mountains. Because the mountain of the Lord's house is going to be in the range of mountains. The Lord's house is going to be in the midst of his children. And each of them is a mountain. We're going to go ahead and break bread today. We have not left the book of Jeremiah just yet. Even while the worship was on today and I was shedding a tear, I heard one say, Concerning me where I was, he weeps like Jeremiah. When I heard that, I was like, okay, I'll take that as a good thing because I like Jeremiah, you know. But as we break bread today, okay, let's read Jeremiah 17, 11 and 19, praise the Lord. And then we're going to just quickly uh, uh, take uh, what I would say is an update or um, a practical experience from, from last Tuesday. It's a, it's a practical experience from last Tuesday. It's like Tuesday was like a science class and somebody went and, and carried out some experiments and now we can learn from their findings. Amen. Yep, 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 yep. Alrighty, let's go. Jeremiah chapter 17, 11. <laughs> you, you, y'all need to brace up for this one. Look at what the Bible says. It says in 11 of Jeremiah 17, that as a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. Right? He gets riches, but no righteousness. So he's victorious, but no life. Like Nicodemus, they, they conquer, they acquire, but they're missing the righteousness component. And look at what else it says. The Bible says it will leave him in the midst of his days and his hand and will be a fool. Now look at verse 19. Verse 19, 19 says, Thus says the Lord to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come and by which, by which the, uh, they come in and by which they go out. And in all the gates of Jerusalem and say to them, Hear the word of the Lord. We're going to stop there. You know, I started telling you about Nicodemus. And that's why I was able to use that. That's why I, I, I used that to explain 
1711. But I want to point out something else from 1711. You see, 1711 talks about people who acquire riches but not the right way. What is the right way to acquire riches? Do you know? The Bible says that a man is satisfied by the fruits of his mouth and by the produce of his tongue, his life is filled with every good thing. Riches are supposed to be commanded by the words that come from your mouth because only that which comes out of the mouth of God stands forever. So your heavenly father created everything. The Bible says forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So the things that God made will never develop wings and fly away because they came from his mouth. And as his child, he wants you to have things that you have spoken into existence. But people have become accustomed to just having wealth that they labored for with their hands. And the Bible says it will leave them. And if it refuses to leave them, they will leave it. One way or the other, it will not stick because it did not come the right way. And so what is the Lord asking you to do? The Lord says in verse 19, now you go and stand by the gate of the ones who know how to walk with God. The children of Judah go and stand by their gate. The way they come in and the way they go out. How do things come into your life? Through your mouth. How do they go out? Through your mouth. Because the power of life and death are in the tongue. So positive and negative. Life and death is in the tongue. The Lord is saying, are you watching the gate of your mouth? As we break bread today, I want to encourage you, be your own mouth gatekeeper. Watch what you say concerning yourself, concerning your children. Watch even the things that you say to God. Do you say to God, oh, do you not care that I perish? Or do you say to him, even if you slay me, I will trust you. What is coming out of your mouth and what is going in? The word of God needs to go into your mouth. This book of the law, the Bible says, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. When you meditate on it, you're breathing in the word of God. You're taking it in. Because Jesus says, unless a man is born of water and of the spirit, and here now I prophesy, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And what does it mean to be born of the water and of the spirit? You need to have received and also be able to give through the same gate. You need to recognize what it means to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. The Bible says, the time is coming and now is. The Lord reminded me of that while I was here in worship. He said to me, he says, tell them the reason why I have been teaching you using palindromes. A palindrome is a word that means, that's, that spells the same whether you read it backwards, I mean, from left to right or right to left. And while we were looking for a small word like minim, the madam teacher here, the instructor, she gave us the word race car. Yeah, madam, yeah, madam, madam, mom, mom. Those are palindromes. You know, you say it one way and say it the other way. Dad, dad, that's a palindrome. If you say from left to right, it's still dad. From right to left, it's still dad. Unless it's broke, then it's no longer dad, it becomes bra. But I tell you what, there are words like that and... Riska was an awesome mom, by the way. He's one of the longest that I know, so well done to you. A round of applause for teacher, damn, and everybody. Praise God. But the point is this. The Lord said to me, I've been teaching you, or I've, been, I've, I've, I've had you teach them in palindromes. He said, because they need to go from right to left and left to right. And one of those things is they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the Lord said to me, he says, the reason why is because I am close. I have come to receive the ones who worship me in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit and in truth is two things, obviously, spirit and truth. What is spirit? Spirit is wind, the breath of God. You understand what I mean? So what comes out of you when you're speaking the breath? But what goes into you from him? Is the truth. The Bible says, buy the truth and do not sell it. So do not accept falsehood into you. Accept the truth and then the spirit will come through you. And the same thing happens to the person who actually receives the spirit because it's called the spirit of truth. The truth is going to come out of them. What God is saying is, I've come for a people who would worship me as my spirit instructs them to. 
because that is the only kind of worship that I care about. I don't care about religion anymore. Jesus said it. Jesus told the woman by the well that the time is coming wherein you don't necessarily have to go to some mountain. You won't be required to perform some liturgy. He said because the Father is seeking those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. If you are in the word of God, which is the truth, you will be in the spirit. And if you have the spirit of God, which is the spirit of Christ, you will speak the truth. The Lord wants you to worship him by listening to what his Holy Spirit is telling you, not by what somebody else is telling you. You understand what I mean? Because when you listen to the Holy Spirit, you will also know the people who are speaking by the Holy Spirit. So let us break bread. Okay, good. Yeah, I was, I was trying to see which one comes first. So on Tuesday, what did I tell you? Okay, break bread because I want you to be able to get this experience and get the full experience. For those who are new, welcome. Good to see you. Um, if I'm going to recognize Adi and Ify, my, nep my wife's nephew and niece from the UK, this is the first time in America. Uh, absolutely. So now, now that you're here, next service, hopefully you'll sit with us as opposed to by yourselves. Oh, yeah, God is good. All righty. And so, so thankful to, to, to meet you guys, Nikki, Sarah, nice to meet you. And um, Ashlyn, nice to meet you too. Thanks for coming out. So we break bread here with an expectation, with a holy expectation to see beyond our noses. Because we want to enter the kingdom of God. We want to press into the righteousness, the peace, and the joy. And we have to be able to see it. And we, what we know is that when Jesus was raised from the dead, those that he broke bread with, even before he went to the cross, his disciples did not know what he meant when he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have a part in him until he broke the bread and gave to them. And he says to them, you see it now? This bread is my body. And this cup, this wine is my blood. And that was when they were like, ah, oh, now we get it. And then when he was raised from the dead, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, who walked with Jesus on a seven-mile journey and did not know that that was the resurrected Jesus. The moment he went with them into their cabin and he broke bread with them, the Bible says their eyes were open and they saw that it was the Lord. And so we know that there is power in breaking bread that allows for you to see. And I am not just saying that as a theological exposition, but I am saying that as something that we have experienced from the time the Lord taught it to my wife and I in Ellsbury, England in 2008. And we have continued to experience that even here at Communion House. There are people who didn't really see visions nor know how to articulate what they see until they became a part of this ritual that we observe. It was one instituted by the Lord Jesus. So when we take it today, I want you to take it with an expectation that the Lord would allow for you to see great and mighty things that you do not know. That you're able to see the way out of where you have been and also see the way to where you need to go and when you get there to see the door that you must knock. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus that this act of obedience will transform your life for the better. In the name of Jesus. I am on such a mission today. So like I was telling you, I was going to explain my attitude and that's it. I am so intense today because of the fact that whenever God tells me specifically that there is about to be deliverance, I get so fired up and I don't want anybody to be left behind. So if I yelled at you at the beginning, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. But you know what I mean? I'm just happy that we made it in the end. So let us eat of the Lord's body. There's nothing that qualifies you for the body and the blood of Jesus. Nothing at all. We were all sinners. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. While we were yet his enemies, he gave himself for us. This is the blood that actually brings you in. So you don't have to say, oh, maybe I need to be nice to my friends for seven days before I can take this. No, it is yours as a gift, a free gift to give you propitiation for sins and to open your eyes. So you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. So we're going to take a bit longer today because, I mean, partly because some people are not here, Manuelita and her family, and we want them to, want them to feel bad a little bit that they missed service so that when they click on that YouTube link and they see that the service is two hours, they're like, oh my God, we're missed. Anyway, we pray for them. We thank God for them. But I want to tell you something about Tuesday. On Tuesday, how many people were here on Tuesday? Adi wasn't here, but he's watched the video, right? Or well, at least part of it. I started to talk to us a little bit more about dimensions 
and how to go in and out of dimensions. And I said that I'm sending you out today by the grace of God with something that you can begin to exercise in and to practicalize. Okay? And so our beloved sister Kayla here took it really far, which is good. She was actually in a trance and she was taken to another dimension. And I, I, I sought her permission to share this because of the fact that I know that it's going to benefit many of us. So I'm going to be very brief, but you still need to hear it. You see, when she was taken to this dimension, she saw somebody that's very close to her that she knows on an operating table. And that person was being operated on, but instead of organs being taken out of them, it was thoughts that were getting extracted from them. You know the way someone would go to the hospital and go for a procedure to remove their appendix or whatever, and you have to separate this body part from that body part to remove that which is not necessary. It was actually thoughts that were being separated from that person, but they were brought out into a spectrum and laid out, and the ones that were not supposed to be were being extracted and removed from this person. And you know what Kayla did? Now, let me dial back to what I told you all not to do. Because what she said to me, she was like, Pastor, I did what you said not to do. Okay? So what did I tell you not to do? I told you not to wait until the heaven's transport system comes by the mercy of God to show you dimensions where power lies to change your world and that of others. I said don't wait until the transport state system comes, until you have a visitation before you begin through the act of meditation by imagination to practice how you will behave in the midst of angels. How many people remember that I said that? I said, you need to practice. I said, because if you don't practice how you're going to behave when you get to the company, because the Bible says it is your destiny to be in the company of innumerable angels. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18 talks about the fact that we have come to the company of just men made perfect in the midst of innumerable angels. So that is where God sees you. So if you're not there yet, keep moving. Let him keep leading you. So we are supposed to be in the company of angels all the time because we also are messengers. And so if you don't think like that, you will find yourself in the midst of angels and you're going to be so amazed that you, will get not, you, you may get nothing out of it. And so guess what happened? Kayla showed up and she at first was like, okay, they said we need to behave right. So I'm not going to scream, even though I want to. But the fact that she was thinking about screaming, and she was so amazed in her thought, she didn't know that the dimension that she was in was the dimension of thoughts. And in the dimension of thoughts, anything you think comes out like words. Very loud. Everybody can hear you. So she became a nuisance in the room. They were trying to operate on this person and the entire time she was like, oh my God, wow, look at this. But she thought she was thinking it. So at first, they did not tell you at first to be quiet. They just gave you the look. They gave you the side eye. Yeah. And then she was like, okay, I'm going to zip it, but I'm still going to be thinking it. And eventually, let's praise God for her life. They put her out of the room. They were like, okay, you are disturbing this process. Stay outside. And I'm glad that that happened because what? It was about 24 hours or so or 48 hours after we, we had that teaching that the Lord gave you that experience so that it becomes known to all of you that what I was saying wasn't just philosophy. What I was sharing with you are things that are meant to be part of your daily walk with the Lord. It's a shame that we have not been taught these things because people want to remain lords over us. Some people want to be the only ones who hear from God so that they can continue to control your life and tell you what they feel you should hear and what you shouldn't hear. But God forbid that we do the same here because we are of the order of discipleship, raising others in the things of righteousness that work for us in fruitfulness. And so I share with you those things that I see. And do you know what happened, Kayla, just today? Ade was in here when I preached. He hadn't watched the entire video when I spoke to him. He asked me a question. He says, what is it about people who get put out of places in dreams the moment they get recognized to be present? I said, ah, that's interesting. You don't get put out of places in dreams because the spirits there recognize that you can see them. No, if you can see them and you're behaving right, 
They're not going to put you out. They put you out because you can see them, but you have not developed the stamina to remain in that place. And for you not to cause the portal to shut, they would rather put you out. Because if they don't put you out, you can make the portal unstable for everybody. Okay? And that is the reason why, let me explain that to you in Jesus' English. Jesus says that if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Right? So if there's any amongst you who is, uh, who, that, that is unbelieving, such a person needs to be put out because that lack of faith can affect everybody else. That was why Jonah was thrown out of the boat. Okay? And so when you show up in the particular dimension in heaven and your attitude is not right and you are saying things that could cause for the operation to be jeopardized, they will put you out. And Jesus did that multiple times when he was here. When he wanted to raise Jairus' daughter from the, from the dead, the Bible says that there were mourners, people who were mourning. And Jesus is like, you are mourning the dead, but I have come to wake them up. We're not of the same mind. Please put all these people out. Even Jesus did not want them to spoil the show. He put them out. Every now and again, people were put out because they were not ready for what was being done. And so you can see that it is expedient and of utmost importance for you to practice the act of meditation. Because what I told Kayla, which I'm going to tell you all now, is that being in the place of meditation is how you learn how to quiet your mind. So when you find yourself in the land of thoughts, in the realm of the spirit, you can teach your mind how to keep quiet, how to not think, and how to just be. <laughs> yeah, because we, our minds are always going. And you know one practical application of that, which you can begin to practice now, is that many of us, we have heard the word of God say to us, fear not, but you're still afraid. The word of God says to you, do not worry, but you still worry. The Lord says, I'm your provider. I got you covered, but you're still nervous. You know why? Simply because even though you have heard the vo word of God, there are voices within you that constitute your thoughts that, can, that have not been taught to be silent in the presence of the word of God. And they're the ones that keep talking to you. <laughs> well, I know you're con confessing scriptures, but that bill is due tomorrow. I know you're confessing scriptures, but have you ever heard of overdraft fees? You better borrow some money before they charge you. Th those voices you need to learn how to bring. The Bible says that we need to learn how to bring them to subjection to the obedience of Christ. So when you find yourself in the corridors of power, you will not be unruly. You will not be thrown out because you have learned how to quiet your spirit and to be in the realm of the spirit without thoughts that speak unless they are asked. Is that good stuff? And I pray that by the grace of God, we will make the time to get into meditation so that we can build spiritual stamina to be able to stand tall among the angels without being asked to wait outside. So thank you for sharing your experience with us. We long to learn more even as you learn more as you go along. And if you have similar experiences from Tuesday or from this meeting, please, I'm more than happy to hear it so that we can be equipped together. One last thing, and Alan is going to come to receive the offering because I see that um, people are now looking at the time more than they're looking at Jesus. So let's wrap it up. I said to you the other day, okay, let me just go straight to the point. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. I want you to take this with you. And every scripture that we have read today, I want you to make it your assignment to memorize it. Make it a point of duty to memorize these things. Let it be like your memory verse. So that is John chapter 3, verse 3, John chapter 3, verse 5, um, Jeremiah chapter 17, 11, Jeremiah 17, 19. Keep these things to heart. And now, Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, and I want to release this over you because of the fact that I found myself in a particular place while the worship was on, and I was reminded of the need for us to use more of the authority that God has given to us. So Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, Then the serpent said to the woman, I want to encourage you folks, the serpent is still talking, till today. And when I saw this, it hit me because that same serpent, when he came to Jesus and he spoke to Jesus, Jesus immediately spoke back the word of God. When the serpent came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, 
He says, oh, you must be hungry. Why don't you turn these stones to bread? Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have come to a season wherein the attack of the enemy on our minds is at an all-time high, and we cannot afford to sit there and just listen. It is poison. The longer it stays in your system, the more it weakens you. So whatever thoughts are coming into your mind that are not of God, whatever negative thoughts are coming to your mind, whatever you conceive of in your mind, immediately subject it to the word of God by finding a scripture that examines and exposes that thing for what it really is. So when the serpent comes to say to you, you say to the serpent, it is written. This is a very, I want you to take this as seriously as God told us to take the prophecy about COVID. Remember when God revealed to us that a disease was coming, an epidemic, and he told us that our hearts must not fail us for fear because we need what? What did he tell us? He said to everyone else that was present in that room two months before COVID was announced, he said, I have a scripture for you and your family so that when that disease of fear is in the news, it will not take your heart for a ride. You will not be afraid. As seriously as we took that is how seriously I want you to take these words that I say to you today. Speak the word of God to every thought that comes. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your visitation today. We thank you for drawing us into your presence and allowing for your angels to surround us. Thank you for allowing your angels to take their position when it was time for us to get into the pool so that we can receive our deliverances. Lord, this is a day that you have made. We rejoice in this day and we will remember this day for good for a long time to come because of the testimonies that will come out of today and the fruitfulness in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Stay for two more minutes. Alan will come and say blessing over the offering. God bless you. See you Tuesday. Come on, let's celebrate the man of God, what the Lord has done here tonight. God is so good. If my brother Gavin will help us with the offering slide, we'll do that quickly. God is good. Let us give cheerfully tonight. We know the Lord is doing here in this house, and I just want us to be renewed in our giving and faith and being a part of what the Lord is doing here in furthering his kingdom and implementing his kingdom here in the earth through communion house. So many of us have received and received and received from this ministry. Let us be encouraged to give. For we know that the word declares that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. God is good. If you need an offering envelope, it's here at the end of the pew. Um, and if you're giving online, you'll see the details here in just a bit, actually. Dollar sign communion house at Cash App, at communion house PayPal, as well as the Zelle giving information via the phone number there. Hallelujah. God is good. With our offerings prepared, Father, we give you praise. There is none like you. Yet again, you show yourself strong in our midst, O oh God. You are our deliverer, our provider. Lord, we say unto you that, you, that we love you. O oh God, we thank you for creating in us pure hearts and renewing within us steadfast spirits, O oh God. Father, we thank you for the gospel of truth, O oh God, which prepares us. There is none like you. We thank you, O oh God, for the ability that you've granted unto us to come into your house to give in your name, knowing that you give seed unto the sower. Lord, look upon every household as they extend in faith, O oh God, to give into this ministry, O oh God, to pour for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, for we know that from you and from you alone comes multiplication, comes increase, O oh God. Lord, be glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. And we all said, Amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again for what he's done tonight. <laughs> Applaud the Lord as the woman of God said. We're so thankful for what he's done in this house. And I don't want us to forget, you know, we have just been pressing in and pressing in every Wednesday in prayer. I want us to continue to take that momentum we've been building and exercise that 
in our day-to-day, -day, as we're at work, as we're uh, uh, picking up our children, just staying in that place of prayer. And we know that's where the Lord has been dealing with us on and has been helping us mightily. All righty. Everyone have a blessed night. We'll see you soon.